What a beautiful piece to sin our, our hearts with, friends. I want to take a quick poll this morning uh, about traveling as we head into summer. So your two options are highways person or back roads person if you're traveling. So who's a highway person? Who wants to get there? Fast and furious, right? Who wants to take their time on the back roads? Kind of meander around. Okay, so about 50-50. We got spread out across um, the, the spectrum of us and how we like to travel. You know, it takes all kinds, right, to go through. And um, but when I was thinking about today and, and about how we travel places, especially headed into summer, you know, I thought about uh, all the small towns that exist in the country and around the world, but especially here, and what happens to them when highways come into being. You know, when the 50s uh, with Eisenhower is really when our highways and interstate system really got built up and started to grow. And so then you now had this choice that we just did before. You had to drive through small towns. That was the only way to get there is to drive through each of the little towns on the way. But now you could take this fast thing called a highway that did not touch any of those small towns. And something happened to those towns along the way in that. Some of us come from those small towns that the highway bypassed or did not choose to go through. And so what happened is they started to crumble or they just got stuck in time. No one knew moved in because it took a little bit of extra to get there. Maybe the motel in town closed up a diner started to get into disrepair because there's no one there bringing in that out-of-town money to keep it going. When the regular traffic stops, the city, the town, kind of stops as well. There's a lament there, especially if the people still living there or who remember it from its heyday of what the town used to be, the vibrancy, the football, the gathering in the town square, events together that have now drifted away. This is the scene that I think about when I think about the Valley of the Dry Bones that Sharon read for us this morning. When you listen to it, it's a very poignant and detailed, but also quite gruesome story in the Bible. We have the prophet Ezekiel just taken from wherever he is and dropped in this valley filled with dry bones. Something terrible has happened there. But it's happened so long ago that they are dry bones. There is no life there. There is no remnant of life there. And even more, no life is coming there. No one is going to choose to be in a valley of dry bones. This happens to our towns as well, right? Once they reach a certain point, there's no industry for people to move into to help revitalize these towns. And so this is the valley that we are in in this story. But it is into this valley that God makes a command through Ezekiel. He tells him to prophesy to the bones. And if we remember the nuance that's present in the Bible around prophesying, it's not necessarily telling the future, but it's interpreting the present in light of God. It's a message from God to a time and a place. And so through Ezekiel, God speaks to these dry bones and he commands them to grow sinew and muscle, flesh and tendon to spring up on these bones that have no life on them. Then he commands Ezekiel to say, let breath fill them. Let the winds of the four corners come and mingle here, crash into the bodies, fill them enliven them, bring them back out of nothingness into fullness. And then we get the prophecy that comes in, the truth-telling that Ezekiel is doing to these people, because God says these dry bones are like the people. They are like Israel. They are cut off. If we remember our biblical history, Ezekiel is active during the time of the exile, 
So Jerusalem has been sacked. The temple has been destroyed. Much of the people have been carted out of Israel and Jerusalem and are scattered to the winds, and they don't know what to do in this time. They have never been without some version of the temple or the ark or a place where God lives. So they do not know what to do when they do not have access to that place because to them, that means they don't have access to God. With the place gone, it feels like God is gone as well. This is the desperation that Ezekiel is speaking into. The people feel lost and unsettled, distant, not sure what their future is or how they are going to move forward into the world. There is a famine of connection to God. They used to be a vibrant town bustling together, a city square, food carts, all of these things together, an active temple place, and then the highway went a different direction, and they were alone. And they were destroyed. And so how can God breathe new life back into this scenario? They are dry bones. They are cut off. Where can God move in this valley? Sometimes it feels like the story is a resurrection story. Things are brought back to life, yes, indeed. But it's also a restoration story a reunion story, being brought back together. God is not necessarily giving new life, but renewed life to the purpose that was there before. An unspoken question that pulls itself through this story is one of God's promises. The Israelites at this point are looking around and saying, God made promises to us. Where are those now? Where is our hope in this hopeless situation? Is God still faithful? Is God still watching out for us? Or are we doomed to be dry bones forever? Verse 11 really pulls it home because it says that the people of Israel say, our bones are dried up. Our hope is cut off. When the temple is destroyed, they feel like there is a separation between them and God, both literally and figuratively. And it is into this that God breathes, that God sends a message. If we were reading it in the original language, the word ruach, which is breath, is used nine times. It's translated both as breath and as wind in the scripture, but nine times it talks about this this breath of God filling the world, word, world. I was right the first time. And as we've talked about before, if it's repeated, it's important. Nine times is a lot of times to say the same dang word. So it must be important. God sees them. God feels them and knows them and is breathing restoration into them. Just like the Israelites here and our small towns out in the world, I bet there are places where we feel like dry bones, where we feel like the highway has passed us by, maybe the highway of life, where we need something to move within us and give us this new restored life where we feel cut off from God or those around us, there are places where we need God to move within us. I was recently reading an article that was talking about um, the seemingly impossible task of caring for a loved one at the end of life or through a medical emergency, and how a lot of times that falls on adult daughters and is draining and an invisible weight that is carried. There's a struggle of loneliness and impossibility there. Spirit, fill us in those times. Our teachers are probably super pumped to feel cut off and alone for a little bit. But what about our students who rely on the school system for connection, for safety, for a hot meal? Spirit, fill us. 
What about in our world where we feel increasingly isolated and our support systems dwindle and we often feel like maybe we are on an island alone dealing with our things and no one else is there standing behind, beside us holding us up. Maybe we don't even know the name of our neighbor. Spirit, fill us. Sometimes we look at our household budgets and wonder how we can make ends meet when the price of groceries just keeps going up. Spirit, fill us. Sometimes we struggle to even get along with those around us to honor our differences, recognizing, as we've talked before, that God doesn't want us to all be the same. God made us the way that we are, that we should honor how we are different in our race, our gender, our ethnicity, our income, our life stages. All of these things make us better, but instead they separate us sometimes. Spirit, fill us. This is just a short list of the ways that we need God to move in our lives. You probably have things in your own life where you need God to breathe into you to fill you up. Sometimes we are in a valley of dry bones where it seems like hopelessness and despair is winning the day, is taking over what's going on, where we are cut off from that highway of life, that highway of Christ's love sometimes. But these are the places where God breathes new life where God loves to work and come into it, where God is bringing restoration in. And sometimes it's a gentle wind slowly nudging us. And other times it is a hurricane coming in, knocking things out of its path, like some of us saw in our neighborhoods last night, where God is breaking through and saying, my spirit, my ra will come in and bring new life. It will fill you up for the days ahead. We've had a lot of stories of commencement speakers, both good speakers and not so great speakers, but today I want to lift up the speaker at the University of Massachusetts. When this person came to speak to the gathered graduates there, some of you may have heard the story. He gave every graduate $1,000. For some of us, that's small change, but for a lot of us, $1,000 is a life-changing gift. But what he said is that you can keep 500 of that, but 500 needs to go to someone else. 500 it needs to go to a person that you know that is in need or someone in need of a, a quiet blessing to a charity of your choice. 500 of it needs to go into the world, needs to breathe new life into someone else. Those students were gifted a tangible way to breathe new life out into the community around them. Imagine the change that all those little $500 can do out into the world. Here at East Dallas, we are about to sell some property, and some of it is going to go to the building for sure. But hopefully some of it can also go to breathe new life out into the world, to do something creative and God-blessed out into the world so that we can be part of that of God, that breath of God forging connection. This story today is of restoration of coming closer to God. And that's a personal story for each one of us to remember that God is working to be restored to us, but also for our world. And that God is working towards restoration in our world for that life-giving wind to blow through. And not just our prayer, but our actions should be partnering with God for that. So that is what is dry may one day have new life. Let us pray. Almighty God, breath of you, we ask to feel you move here in this space, but also out in the world. You fill us so that we can in turn fill others and bless others in your name. 
Help us to open our eyes to the places in our life, in our family, in our community, in our world, where your new life is needed, Lord. Help us to be partners with you. In your name we pray. Amen.